In the long run, I don't care how it sounds. Let's just you know, go and have fun, enjoy ourselves. If it doesn't sound right, you just don't release it. If, if you don't enjoy yourself when you're doing it, that, that comes through. I've yet to meet anybody that had a really bad time in the studio and made a really good record. I gotta talk to somebody about maybe getting plugged in. <laughs> hey Joe, Joe, can we hear the loud parts? We're, we're accustomed to going in and doing like three songs in a weekend, or even the one time we did six. We rehearse the song pretty thoroughly before we come into the studio. So we kind of know what the song is gonna be like or what we want it to be like. But you know, here and there trying different things. Let me hear you play that dun 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 dun. That's definitely bass. That's probably good. We come out of the old days when studios were really expensive. So you would rehearse a lot, so you could go in, get it done, and then get the hell out of there before the check bounced. So that was why, then we still, it's hard to get out of that mindset. So let's run through the song. You guys want to run through it real quick? I don't know. What we, no, we just showed up with our instruments and everything because we <laughs> thought there was a tea dance. <laughs> Back then I was more nervous about playing live than recording because I always thought recording, if you make a mistake, you can do it again. What didn't enter my mind was that it costs money and that there is a limited time to perfect it. And then another thing I learned is that when, when I was forced to do something so many times to perfect it, I hated it. Because <laughs> I'm not a perfectionist and I don't care to do it. Some of it was really rough, particularly for Dave, who I really, if I could apologize to one person who is who's no longer here, I would totally apologize to him because the studio was like Chinese water torture for him. Uh, there were records we made where they made him repunch everything. And that's, here's a guy who invented a bass style that a lot of people copied. You know, really a first class musician. And okay, now punch this, punch that. You wanna hit stop? That was good. I could live with either of those takes. I mean, first in a platonic relationship, and then we'll see how things work out, and maybe it'll be an engagement. You know, in a small wedding. Do you guys want to hear, hear those back? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, come on, those last two were great. Uh, a lot of producers will say, you know, I, I, are you sure you want to play it that way? Which is a basic way of saying you can't play. It was already better. Yeah, yeah, you're right. If you got the performance, you know what I'm saying, if something just a little bit off, Brian knows that if you move it right on time or whatever, it ain't gonna sound right. It sounds right in the moment. I, I, I like that about it. I like a live sound. It's a lot more fun than being in a tiny studio, you know, kind of airless zone with somebody yelling at you that you have to do this this way and that way. That sounded great. It's either the last one or the second to last one. Yeah. All right, yeah, but so, I mean, in there, because uh, I could try it again if you want. It's oh, like, no, we definitely right, got okay. it. We right, definitely, got it? Okay. definitely, yeah. yeah. Over time, I've heard little stories, little anecdotes of their time being on the label, and it does not sound like something I would have wanted to be on. When, when you have a hit, they want another hit. It's like they're not satisfied. Now you're being, the people that you want, you sought out, you set out to destroy, are now coming in trying to co-op you. We thought that we were kind of being molded into something that we weren't. I was gonna say, in general, yeah. You're a little ahead of the beat? Probably, yeah. 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 Maybe little, maybe pull yeah. it back just a little bit. I'll if try, we but I'll need, I'll need to call, like well, to bring it in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can yeah. give you like a beer. Suddenly, it seemed like we couldn't say no to things anymore. They'd say, you have to make a video. And I was against videos. I suggested that we hire other people to perform as us, and our manager said, no, you can't do that. And this has, this is touch, touch sensitive, right? Yeah. It is. Yeah, just, just try to hold back tempo-wise. I'm also touch sensitive. <laughs> we lost control in how we could publicize ourselves, simply because we had a hit. Worst period of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say that, I, I'm honest about it. It's a tough job when a record label says things like, if you don't move this many units of <laughs> a record before, this date, then we're gonna drop you. Are you ready to sing, sir? 
You ready to sing, Rodney? Ryan, this is the third time in a row you've woken me up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to start giving out your home address over the internet. I grew up as a fan, so in my mind it was always like they were rock stars, you know. And then I met Joe in 1995, and it was immediately like he was a friend of mine. All three of them are very laid back. There's no like rock star attitude at all with them. There's no ego. Step back from the mic about two inches. How's that? All right, let me, let's start, let's record a pass of this. Okay. Stay right where you are. Hang on one second. Well, we did have the luxury of supporting ourselves with the band. It was discouraging, honestly, when the money was running out and I realized I had to get a day job, but Nothing about the day job took away my will to write songs. I was writing songs maybe even at a more furious pace. It made me, I think, structure my time even better having that job. I hate to say it, but that's true. Yeah, it sounds awesome, Rodney. It sounds really awesome. In the middle part, I reversed lyrics. Um, and I made it like they, they lower your hours and increase your wages and just started laughing my ass off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, who would complain about that? <laughs> People always talk about this at one point about Bruce Springsteen kind of trying to emulate what's up with the working class and, and not really being able to pick up on it because he's not working anymore. So I would say I'm the guy Bruce Springsteen wishes he was. <laughs> there was a bank that offered them a lot of money to use like a bastardized version of Punk Rock Girl uh, and they said no. And that's absolutely inspiring to me because we could all use a little extra money and they turned it down on, you know, because they have integrity. No one writes songs about the poor anymore, which is really a shame. We could use a couple more. I grew up working class. I have a lot of working class issues. You know, every time somebody tells you a great story about a rock star doing something, it was great. He, you know, he, he set the room on fire. I'm thinking, well, somebody had to put that out. You know, somebody had to come. You know, I want to hear the song written from the perspective of the guy who was up there with the fire extinguisher. Some praise for the maids who cleaned up the rooms after they were trashed by the Lake Keith Moon, or the guy who fixed the TV that Elvis shot, the nanny who watched his kids while McCartney scored pot. There's a support crew for music that we don't think about. You know, when you wake up and you're on the road and it's you know, free continental breakfast downstairs, the person who made the free continental breakfast will never know what they contributed to your record. To be dicks to those people is probably why so many records in the 70s were terrible. You know, Eagles records were terrible. I bet the Eagles were dicks to a lot of people. Let this be the start of our revolution. Let this be the day that we take it all back. Let the writing on the wall be our manifesto. Let this be the day we go on the attack. You don't hear anybody discuss poverty or anger issues or wage inequality. Everybody who writes a song now just wants to get their song in a credit card ad so they can get a brownstone somewhere. You know, that's, that's criminal. And, 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 you know, there will be, one day there will be rock and roll Nuremberg trials. And some people are going to have to answer for their crimes. Every time in the studio is fun, actually, for me. Even if I've complained about it afterwards, I still have fun. You're with your friends. You, you've got something that you've shepherded from it being an idea in your head all the way to it being a full-blown thing with guest musicians and, you know, live. And, and how can you not enjoy that? That is a lot of fun. We still have music we want to make, and Rodney has tons of things to say lyrically. <laughs> I probably got, like, four Dead Milkman albums that nobody's heard song-wise. So the future of recording is me recording from the grave. You don't even have to die anymore. I think bands have to think about what they view as success. I mean, for us, I think now, you know, putting out our own records and recording and playing shows when we're able and when we think it's a good idea to, that equals success for us. When I joined the band, that was the focus to to make sure we did it for fun. If anybody stopped having fun, we'd stop doing it. And as far as I know, none of us have stopped having fun yet, so.
Shaking Through is produced by Weather Day Music, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting independent music and the community that surrounds it. Your support helps sustain this series, which creates bold new art and resources to inspire the independent music community. To get involved, go to weathervanemusic.org.